welcome to another chat with Adam and David Harpole. Jack, as always, good to see you today. Indeed. So one of the things that we've um, heard from a number of people kind of on the news, you've probably read about it yourself, just the word inflation. And we thought it'd be a good thing just to run through in terms of one, what is really inflation? And then two, are there things that you can prepare for or that you can control pertaining to the word inflation? So let's kind of kick off with, I guess, a, a basic um, definition, if you will, Jack, for what is inflation or, or what most people think of as inflation is maybe a better way. I mean, just like the general rise in the cost of living, I think is what most people would say. Like if I go to the grocery store and I buy a gallon of milk and it's $3 today and it's $4 next year, like that's inflation. I think most people kind of yeah. get, it's also kind of insidious in the way that it, it's very, it tends to be anyway, it's kind of low over time, but it does chip away at the value of your purchasing power over time, which is like a whole other discussion on like investment returns and what you're really trying to get and versus real returns, which we're not going to talk about. But um, so, you know, the Fed has a goal, like, you know, whether they achieve it or not is irrelevant, but their goal is to basically have peg inflation at 2% a year, which you can think of as a 2% devaluation of your purchasing power per year. You know, that basically cuts the purchasing power of a dollar today by 50% over the next call it 30 years or so you can kind of think of that way if you're retiring today and you're 65 and you have a 30 year retirement a dollar today will buy you half as much in 30 years is kind of how they're that's what they're paying of course which is not right to do. so how, i mean how do you offset that i guess there, there's not a whole lot to control if that's the fed's target other than hopefully you would make more money to help offset that right but we know and I don't know the statistic specifically, but I, I definitely have read this in the past that what we're making today as a percentage of what we were doing 30 years ago pales in comparison to the actual cost of things. And I think in the example, I'll uh, have to look for it, but it was a car, you know, a $5,000 car 30 years ago, if it was 5,000 today is a $45,000 car. Yeah. But if you're making 30 grand, 30 years ago, like say right out of college, you're not making 130 out of college today. Yeah. Right. Like when you're younger and your parents tell you how they went to the movies and it was like a nickel to yes. get in and for the popcorn and you'd like, oh my God, you're ancient. And now I think about things and I'm like, oh yeah, I used to buy things for, you know, soda was 25 cents. I'm sure I sound like a, a dinosaur <laughs> as well when I say those things. But yeah, I mean, I think most people typically understand that. I think as far as like, I do know real wages, meaning adjusted for inflation, have not really budged much in the last 40 years, really since the 70s. Um, as far as, which is real, just meaning the gross minus inflation, real wages have a, a basically. So we're not, we're not making that much more, basically. No, it, it had in if you subtract out inflation, wages are roughly the same, but has not grown, which prior to that was not true. Prior to that, wages grew over, it had been growing uh, up until that point. I don't know the exact number of years. Obviously, I'm just kind of spitting these things off the top of my head. I don't, these are kind of general numbers, but I do know that since the 70s or so, real wages have pretty much been stagnant. So that's like, a, like so if, let's, if you just think through inflation, right? And you just think if things will go up in price over time, and how does that affect me, I guess, or my investments or whatever you would think? And I think it depends one on, you know, well, which investment, of course, it depends. Right. Um, you know, I can you we can use like, if you own a home, we can use your home as like an example of, of how it can affect different things. So I, we would normally say like, if you bought a home today and you pay whatever the interest rate was, 2% or something, 3%, whatever it ends up being, you most people would say, oh, this cheap money, you know, inflation over time, blah, 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 blah. Um, we've probably said this before is that there's also the other side of the equation, which is kind of the uh, maintenance and taxes and insurance. And those things are somewhat tied to inflation, you would think. I and mean, if, yeah. if wages started going up and it costs more money to maintain your house, well, that's somewhat tied to inflation. If the nominal value of the house goes up due to inflation, because you think maybe your home's some kind of inflation hedge, 
well, your taxes will go up and your insurance will go up. It's just going to cost more. So if, if inflation was 8%, even if you thought my insurance cost tracks inflation, well, your insurance costs are going to go 8% a year, even if your mortgage doesn't change a whole lot. So That's it's not a always kind of dry. It's yeah. like, and insurance, I think, is a great one. I mean, taxes are somewhat, I guess, regulated. Like, we're capped here in yeah. Pinellas County. I think it's 3% to the max that can go up. But that's not true with interest, interest rates. I mean, last year, we did this, I think, in another one. Um, homeowners rates went up 30 to 50%, depending on the company. So, you know, I didn't, I mean, you haven't didn't give me a 30% raise last year. So, you know, that's big. That's big, especially if that keeps going. Well, yeah, and you would think that, you know, if you had, so let's say, like you said, in, in, in Pinellas County, but general, I think in Florida, you know, you have capped property tax rates on a homesteaded property. This is going to mean nothing to people in other places probably, but here you can get a homestead, kind of homestead your private, your primary residence, it caps your property taxes on and on. That's not true everywhere, of course. Not everywhere does that. Not everywhere has capped um, true. tax rates, but you could... I can foresee a situation where let's say we did get some kind of oh, 6% inflation for some extended period of time that puts a lot of pressure on that cap to say, well, we can't continue to cap property tax rates. If our cost as a, as a city or a county or state are going up six, 7% because we have to pay people to work, obviously. So if our costs are going up six or 7% and we're capping property taxes at three or something, um, that, that would, you would think would put a lot of pressure on that. Obviously, this is very local in Florida. I think right. most of our tax revenue comes from tourism, so maybe it's a little bit different. But it's not. It's not cut and dry. It's not buy a house. It's an inflation hedge. Not necessarily. Right. There's lots of things that it, it could be affected by, um, and there's lots of different inputs, I guess, to the value and the maintenance of your home. I guess is a way to put yeah. it. Well, and and we had talked about this before we hit record, but. Um, just inflation in general and the generations that have experienced it versus not, I would say we're in a, you know, let's call it in the forties. Um, you, you'll be 40 this year, by the way. No. So now I get to say that you'll be in your forties. Um, you know, I remember inflation as a topic only because my parents, I think talked about it, right. I was born in 76 inflation in eighties, early eighties was like 18, 19, maybe even 20% mortgage rates were 18%. So they kind of went hand in hand, if you will. We now in our generation as let's say adults last 20 years have experienced lower inflation and yeah. rates, even if we, if we want to say the same two things. And then people like your daughter, Alex, who's what, 18. I think the term to her is probably like, what's outside of textbook knowledge? What, how would, do you think she would know what real inflation actually means? No. I, I mean, I don't foresee her going into the financial business, it being like a thing, right. but I can see it being something that, you no, know, somebody who's 25 that is in the financial business today or 23 or 24 or something like that, just coming out of college, like, um, you know, talking about something that happened 20 years before they were born is like, you know, <laughs> You might as well be talking about the Civil War, as far as you know. so as I would have thought of it. Like look, for sure, yeah. Like what? Yeah. yeah, like all right, whatever, old man, get out of here. That doesn't happen yeah. anymore. What your your phones had a cord on them? Are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So I think the more you know, who knows? I think it, inflation is just a difficult thing to predict. I, I think you know a lot of people would say, well, we've got all these stimulus packages and we're, you know, quote unquote, printing money and all these things, which can get very, very complicated from an economic standpoint. But m most people think if you put more money into the system, therefore, what's already existing, there's more of them. It's worth less, which is somewhat true. But there's lots of competing things that yeah. can put pressure on the, in the opposite direction. So there's maybe there's more money, but goods are cheaper because I think the Internet and a lot of things have made things cheaper. There's yep. all kinds of stuff that you could say. So it's not easy to say, well, this, therefore this equals this. There's all kinds of second, third, fourth, 10th order effects that may or may not influence it. But in a general sense, I think this is a lot of times this is our answer to a lot of things is, you know, you can have lots of different investments that will act different ways, depending on whatever kind of inflation regime or disinflation or deflation regime that you're in. Some things will do well in different environments. 
you know, if you own a company, let, let's say there's a company that is, you know, I guess you'd call that kind of a long duration company, some company that's not making any money today. The idea is that 20 years from now, 10 years from now, 15 years from now, it will make a lot of money, right? Mm -hmm. So it's growing, 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 growing. It doesn't make, it's losing money now because it's reinvesting into growth or whatever the case is. There's, I give you a million examples, it's kind of irrelevant, but in 15 years, it will be worth something. But if they're the kind of company that always has to be borrowing money, going back to the financial markets to borrow money and interest rates or the, the cost of borrowing, instead of being one or two, it's seven or eight, it makes it more difficult to get to that point where you're actually making yeah. money. And you may not make it past that just because you can't, even if it is a good idea, you just don't have the liquidity or, or the ability just to get to that particular point. There's other companies that are, you know, I guess you call them lower duration. They make a lot of money now. They're really, they make a lot of cash flow, I guess you would say, but maybe they're in a slowly dying business. I don't know what that would be. I, you, there's probably a million that you could name. Some will end up going away and some won't. I don't know what that would be. Maybe that's, you know, the railroads or something. I have no clue, but something where you feel like, ah, oh, this is a business that is somewhat on a slow decline. Yeah. But right now it makes a lot of money and has a lot of cash flow and pays a ton of cash out to investors. It, that would be, you would think anyways, somewhat more valuable in a high inflation environment because I get my money right now and I can spend it on something versus having to wait right. 15 years from now to actually make it. Money. Out. So it sounds like a, a case for some diversification if we're talking investments and inflation, right? Like, you know, you want to put all your money in one thing and hope it works out, spreading it across these different um, things is it's broad advice. So this isn't specific investment advice, but in general, that's one way to help minimize the impact of inflation that is really unknown at this point. We don't know if it's, it's going to creep up, it's going to spike, it could be deflation, you know, all these things right. play a role. So, yeah, and I think. Well, again, I, I guess depending on who you talk to, um, people who have lived through a higher inflation environment, like the 70s or early 80s, I think will be a little bit more um, cognizant of how bad it can be if you get a lot of inflation. Somebody who's younger obviously is not going to get that. But it's not as if the opposite, like if you, I guess the opposite in this case, I'm saying more like deflation. I mean, that's not great either. You know, right. prices are going down 2% a year. It tends to, at least, like I said, there's so many competing variables in here, so it's not like a, this equals this, but you know, if prices are going down 2% a year, people tend to wait because they figure, well, it'll just be cheaper next year. So nobody spends any money just <laughs> waiting for things uh, to, to be cheaper. Right. I mean, that's, that's a typical argument for why you have to peg some kind of inflation is to get people to spend money because right. holding on to it costs money. So I, I, it's senseless to hold on to my cash. I need to invest it in something productive so that it grows over time versus deflation, which would actually somewhat pay you to hold on to it and not do anything. That's true. Over time. So that's a typical argument. But you know, like with any of these things, there's just so many competing variables that determine this. It's hard to say, well, if we do stimulus, we pay a bunch of money at inflation. Like right. that maybe, but there's other things that could come into play that could make that not be the case, whatever yeah. that be. Well, I think the recent five or six years would be an example of that because let's go back to the financial crisis, which was 08, 09, right? Well, coming out of it really in 09, but they started the quantitative easing and they did three of those, QE1, QE2, and QE3. And I think that was over like, I think the last one ended 2015. I'd have to go back and double check that, but that's six years of the government printing money, so to speak. That's what everybody said. Well, if we keep printing money, yep. prices to, to buy things and inflation is going to skyrocket. Now, I don't know how long it takes for that to show up. The point is it hasn't showed up yet. And it's uh, been a long time since they stopped QE, whatever. It's just an endless argument. Like, it's hard to say. There's the frustrating thing about, I mean, honestly, the frustrating thing about so much of this stuff is there aren't easy answers. <laughs> There's no cut and dry easy right. answer to any of these things. And investing your money for the long run and sticking with it is hard. And anybody who says it's not hard, you just do this and that makes money is a moron and probably hasn't been doing it for very long. It's hard to make money and grow assets over time. It's over emotionally time. difficult. It's intellectually difficult. It takes a lot of discipline. I mean, these things are not easy to do and it 
it would be nice to say, oh, well, they printed a bunch of money, bunch of inflation. Let me take the pro-inflation trade and put everything in there and voila, I make money. But it just doesn't tend to work like that, unfortunately. No. Um, it, Let me throw in one other. It's also socially difficult. Yes. Build wealth over time because it's not sexy. It's definitely not. It's way more fun to talk about a quick return or how awesome you did on something, right? As it was a, yeah, just saving my money every month for that one day. Yeah, right. You know, I'm just plugging away. And then they go home and talk about, man, that day, what a square. Jeez. <laughs> All he does is say, geez. Um, yeah, yeah, a little. <laughs> exactly. It's hard to do. Like, it's hard to do it consistently over time, but right. you've got to, you know, somewhat stick with it. So, anyways. The inflation thing is interesting. It's, you know, it's, it's interesting to talk about. Um, it's kind of, you know, one of those seems like four horsemen. Mm -hmm. Everybody's always afraid of it. Um, so we'll see if it ends up showing up. Maybe it will and maybe it won't. But I think if you have a significantly diversified portfolio, you've got some international investments, you know, if, if inflation follows that the dollar is less competitive globally than you would think, well, I have some money invested in foreign companies and I've dominated in foreign currencies. That, that may be a little bit of a inflation hedge. Oh, perhaps. Yep. I don't know. Who knows? I think it's a cool topic. It's fun. It actually makes me want to reach out to a couple of people um, on both sides of the equation. If we're like in the middle, like go back to my parents and say, just tell me a little bit about <laughs> what it was like there. And then ask, you know, for me, I guess, It'd be like Alex, your daughter or somebody, or my niece, you know, is also in the same age bracket. Like, all right, what, what do you think that means? And just see what they have to say, because perspectives a lot in a lot of the decisions we make. So I would love to get the opinion of somebody who's in, the, you know, 25 to 30, like what their opinion would be on inflation. Like if I told you, oh, this thing has happened in the 70s, like, do I sound like a dinosaur or yeah. is that 70s? Right. All right, that's our homework assignment. Let's do that, and maybe we can report on it in a future chat. All right, see you. All right, see you.